to be in the form of a story. I'm, I'm holding my memory back. I stuck with me. I hope you don't mind me storytelling. So I transitioned to the uniform in 2014. Let me take you back to 2005. I was a brigadier general and returning home from one of my tours in Iraq. Because the Air Force was incredibly busy at the time. Actually, they're busy all the time. Uh, rotating troops were shipped back home by a contracted airliner. Kuwait was the hub for this travel. One of the entry points for my fellow service personnel and I from the combat zone was Baltimore, Washington International Airport. So it was military aircraft out of Baghdad, landing Kuwait, Kuwait for contract air, cross land and ocean, and arrive in Baltimore. I'm telling you this as context for the reason as I moved to my next gate for the final leg home when I was in my combat uniform and hygienically challenged. As I moved through the airport, folks called out, thank you for your service. As they passed or stopped to shake my hand. Not very many people, mind you, but it happened about five times. And about the fifth time, I put my head down. I picked up the pace of my step. I was feeling a mix of embarrassment, sort of a I am not worthy of this intention embarrassment. And then, cruising past sights and smells I had not sensed in a while, I felt something else. Now, please understand, I was awfully tired at that point in my travels. But I thought silently to myself, you know, people, I've been doing this for 26 years now. And you never said anything to me or my wife before. And just as I was having that somewhat self-centered thought, I arrived at my gate in a little puddle jumper rock plane that would take me to our home, to our quarters that were at that time in Southern Virginia. I looked around for a seat. The gate area was packed with people, and the only spot open was next to a slight elderly fellow who was staring out the giant airport window. He had on a blue baseball cap. You know, the blue baseball cap that so many veterans wear. I know you've seen them. The cap had writing on it, a little embroidered ship. An old Navy guy, I thought clearly. Okay. I came close to him, pointed at the empty seat to his left, and said, Hey, sir, okay, if I sit here. He turned and looked at me in my wrinkled combat uniform, having no clue what I was except for the U.S. Army name tape over my heart. And he said, sure, go ahead, soldier. And then I saw it. The words on his cap came into focus for me. There was a C and an A and a dash and the number 35. See, CA is a hull designation. Uh, in this case, for cruiser, armored, which means warship. And the number ship's number was 35. And then there would be an embroidered arch uh, over an embroidered image of a battleship. What's the ship's name? USS Indianapolis. And I stopped dead. As my limited knowledge of military history came flooding back, I thought, is it possible that I was going to sit next to one of only 316 survivors of the 1,200-man crew of the last ship sunk in the Pacific? The USS Indianapolis, the ship that delivered the first atomic bomb, bomb to an island airfield from which we launched the war ending attack on Hiroshima. They reminded that the India she was called was Apple's Bruce's flagship, a heavy cruiser, fought all across the Pacific Theater, burning 10 battle stars. I remember reading in a book called Fatal Voyage about how it was hit by a torpedo and sank in 12 minutes, leaving 900 survivors bobbing in the water. But because of beyond tragic errors of omission, no one knew she went down. And for three and a half days, 900 Americans treaded water. Slowly, they became barely 300 dehydration, exposure, dementia, and shark attacks. Took the rest of them. I think all this is I set my back down slowly. And I looked at him and I said, were you on the Indianapolis? He smiled and said, yeah, I joined her at Mare Island in 43, served on her for the rest of the war. And he said, well, the rest of my war anyway. And I assumed he meant the war ended with the sink. I felt a little uncomfortable, so we just started talking like a couple of veterans do. The profession of arms has its own language, though. And no matter when or where you serve, uh, you can talk to another veteran and they'll understand. He had a great conversation. We talked about life in the service then and now. It was says between the Navy and the Army, who's smarter, better, stronger, has a tougher. Uh, soldiers say, you know, don't you guys talking? Even though our service is separated by 60 years. And I finally got around to asking him about those 84 hours in the water. 
and he just looked down and said, it was bad. It was very bad. I lost so many friends. And then he looked out the window, and we were quiet for a while. But during this quiet moment, I looked around the bustling airport at the folks sitting around us, young and old, a couple of happy college-age folks directly across from us were dressed in what looked like pajamas. They were carrying giant pillows, so maybe they were pajamas. Uh, wires were coming from their ears. The wires were attached to mobile devices, and they stayed in their virtually delivered, well-entertained world. Close by the ticket counter, a man was complaining to the airline agent about how much he paid for his first-class ticket, how many miles he had now, and how he expected for the airplane to be on time. He didn't care that there was bad weather in Chicago. By God, the airline should just get another plane. A woman behind us was talking on her phone. So, so loudly that we all heard about her life and her opinions about everything. An energetic four-year-old was doing one sprint between the rows of seats, screeching happily every now and then and knocking over a waiting passenger's carrier. And staring at this, well, I got a little annoyed. Again, I was beat. It had been 17 hours of flying for me, only 30 hours prior. I'd been armed in full body armor rolling through Baghdad. I hadn't slept much. Right then, I wanted to stand up on my chair and in my best command voice call everyone together and try to sit down there in apathy and recognize this man. This an elderly American veteran who almost 60 years ago to that day, amazingly enough, survived unspeakable horror and hardship so that they, these people at Gate 32C, at the far end of a huge airport, could have their safe trip home. They could have this, the freedom to complain without worry of arrest, so they can live in a land of plenty with a vibrant economy where you can buy all kinds of electronic devices to plug into your earbuds, and where there is more than one airline. This little old man was one of the reasons they could have enough of a belief in a safe and secure future that they'd actually want to raise children. I looked over my new Navy friend, back at our little slice of the American public, and I thought to myself, you people have no idea who is sitting among you. And then... And I thought about my own weak moment right before I saw the blue wall cap. The one I told you about when I thought to myself, hey, you're just now noticing us in uniform. And I felt pretty small. I realized this sailor and veterans just like him, just like you, UT system veterans, who are present today have been and are around me every day. And I hadn't said a word to them either. It was driven home to me once again about the role of American soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and Coast Guards. It's called service for a reason. We all choose to place our country, our families, and our well-being, and the future of both, above ourselves. It is service, and we are servants. And we have no desire for rewards or recognition. Our reward is simply the honor of having done so, sir. It was in the airport that day my anger subsided. And I was overcome with a feeling of gratitude and pride. I felt so fortunate to have met and shared a moment with the, uh, my elderly Navy buddy. We sat next to each other silently, the old warrior, him, and the middle-aged warrior, me, basking in the glow of our handiwork. Happily out-of-control children, momentarily unfeeling and inconsiderate adults, and all of them free Americans. I had the honor of speaking at a veterans function at UTSA the week before last. I was trying to describe to others the value our veteran students bring to the classroom. I mentioned a number of things that evening, only one of which I will mention today. Military service changes you. And regardless of your personality traits upon arrival at basic training, one that is so much more highly developed throughout your service is that great indicator of maturity, gratitude. In uniform service, you develop a supreme sense of gratitude. In fact, for little things, double things like good weather, safely taking off on an aircraft and safely landing in it. No matter how bumpy or uncomfortable the trip might be, you're grateful for ice. Like God, ice. Ice in any form, blocked, cubed, crushed, it's like gold. You're also great for electric, grateful for electricity, air conditioning, and reliable indoor plumbing. Little things like that you never again take for granted. You're also shaken awake intellectually by being thrust overseas and immersed among the less fortunate. We find ourselves in the service so grateful for the big things, things we took for granted when we woke up every day in the United States. Things like self-determination, freedom of choice, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, representative government, the ability to pursue a dream. The 
dream that comes with being an American. So UT system teammates, jumping back to my airport waiting area story, you never know who's standing next to you in line. In line at the store, sitting next to you at the movie theater, riding the elevator with you at Asheville Smith Hall. It's our habit to pay strangers no mind, but they could be members of the Korea, Cold War, Vietnam, Grenada, Panama, Somalia, Balkans, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, and Horn of Africa experience. One of your fellow Americans who chose to put a portion of their lives on hold and through selfless and perseverance in their commitment to freedom, allow all of us to enjoy the freedoms we do today. So today, this week, we pay attention to them and we honor them. Thank you for my patience with me today. Thank you for your patience with me.